fracking has environmental impacts, as we briefly went through last video. However, as also mentioned, there are ways to minimise the risks of such impacts coming out into fruition. However, I only went over the direct impacts of water injection, which is fracking's unique technique. There is also the issue of flowback water, methane leaks that can occur during extraction, and of course, carbon emissions from burning the gas. Flowback water can majorly impact the groundwater, in a similar way to injection water. But there are different elements in flowback water to injected water. Before we get into the impacts of flowback water and methane, it should be explained what they are and where they come from. We'll start with flowback water, which is the injected water after it has been used to fracture the shale. The flowback water includes some nasty elements dissolved into the water during the fracking operation. These elements include traces of poisonous metals such as mercury and radioactive materials such as uranium. These are all natural elements in the earth, small amounts of which will be in shale. There is also the problem of target gases dissolving along with carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulphate. All in all, it sounds like a cocktail you wouldn't want to drink. The risks to the environment are very similar to basic fracking injection water, such as making water dangerous to drink, etc. An incredible surplus of flowback water is produced with fracking, with 350,000 to just under 600,000 litres being produced in the first two weeks. These numbers reduce down to around 1,000 and 2,400 after a few months of fracking. It may be obvious that this water is unsuitable to be allowed anywhere near the environment, but there are some options for the water to be treated. Firstly, you can drill another well below the impermeable shale and inject the flowback water below the shale cap. This would be deep enough to avoid coming into contact with aquifers containing fresh water, so it won't affect the environment. However, there are of course problems with this solution. For example, in Ohio in March 2014, this method caused earthquakes of up to three on the Richter scale after the water injected into crystalline rocks under the shale caused a fault to reactivate. This was described by geologist Robert Skumal as an isolated case, and he also says that the earthquake could be felt but did not pose any risk. It also appears to be avoidable by UK regulations, as the injection would have been stopped much earlier as smaller earthquakes were detected days before the big one. The second solution is to simply inject the flowback water back into the well for the purpose of more fracturing. This is the cheapest and easiest option, probably why it's so common in the US, however it comes with the biggest problems. The constant reuse will concentrate the harmful elements in the flowback water, which can clog up the well, making the drilling pad completely useless until it is cleared, which I can assume is very, very expensive. There is also the higher risk of environmental damage should the flowback water leak from the well. Neither of these solutions would be allowed within UK or EU regulations, for fairly obvious reasons. There are two more remedies which are similar in method and can have parallel endpoints. The first of these two options is to treat the flowback water on site for reuse as fracking injection water. This process removes the total suspended solids, or TSS, in flowback water which removes the dissolved harmful chemicals, so they cannot clog the well. The treated water is then mixed on site with fresh water to then be ready for injection for fracking. Treating water on site can usually cover the first two weeks flowback water and easily cover the flowback capacity in later months. This is a relatively more expensive but much safer alternative to the second unregulated solution and removes all risks of well clog for the fracking company. The second regulated option is to treat the flowback water either on or off site and pump it back into freshwater reservoirs. Before you scream about allowing chemicals back into the environment, you should know that the water has to have a TSS under a regulated amount before it can be let near the environment, even in the United States. This water needs to be transported either from the site to the treatment plant or from the mobile treatment unit on site to a natural freshwater reservoir. These create a very large transport cost for water to be handled properly. To conclude flowback water, it is another case of injection water. It can have risks, however there are regulations in place to minimise the risks. Maybe not in the US, but in the UK and the EU. However, the problem is actual water supply. Lucy Field, an energy consultant who has authorised a report for the UK Department of Energy and Climate Change about shale gas, says... 
The main issue is water disposal. The flowback water can only be recycled at most three times before it has to be disposed. In the US, they truck the water in and out, but in the UK, they may have to build pipelines, which costs. Along with saying it will be very expensive to follow regulation to keep the water safe for the environment, I think it's worth pointing out that these expenses might make fracking completely pointless to proceed as expenses might cause profit to be negligible. Now on to methane. According to the British Geological Survey, or the BGS, methane is an important greenhouse gas and common in groundwater. It also mentions the compound's explosive trait. Methane has a baseline that varies from place to place. It all depends on the methane concentration in the rocks the water flows through. The mean value of methane in groundwater has been found to be less than 10 micrograms per litre. However, there have been findings of up to 500 micrograms in natural water, which has flowed through common UK rock beds. Beds that allow for no movement of groundwater inside them have been found to be up to 1,500 micrograms per litre, which is 100 micrograms below the explosive threshold of methane in groundwater, assuming complete degassing. But this is almost impossible. The BGS also mentions here that up to 16,000 micrograms of dissolved methane have been found in groundwater in organic rich shales, where fracking will likely occur. The damage methane does to the environment appears to be dependent on whether the methane escapes groundwater or not, as there are no known health hazards for ingesting methane. However, it does add into the greenhouse effect should it escape groundwater and reach the atmosphere. This is a possible consequence of fracking, as methane can leak from wells. But methane leakage usually happens after decommission, when concrete and steel start to crack and corrode in the decommissioned well. A study by Durham University indicates that the methane gas emitted from these decommissioned rigs are less than the amount of methane from livestock grazing in the same field. Since methane's main concern is the greenhouse effect, I think I may as well talk about the greenhouse effect briefly, and carbon dioxide emissions as a result of extracted shale gas use. The greenhouse effect has been known for quite some time, since 1896 in fact, and was discovered by Svante Arrhenius. It was discovered that more CO2 in the atmosphere, the warmer the planet became, due to the trapping of the sun's radiation. This is actually an important process, and without it, global temperatures would be at around minus 18 degrees Celsius. However, the modern problem comes when the effect is so great, global temperatures rise too quickly, which is exactly what is happening. However, it has been discovered since then that methane is actually 30 times more potent in the greenhouse effect than carbon dioxide. With leakage of methane being observed as very low, it shouldn't be a huge problem from fracking, unless later evidence from UK studies suggest otherwise, which I doubt it will. However, we can talk about what the shale gas will be used for, which is generally energy. To be used for this, it has to be burned, which of course creates CO2, our main greenhouse gas. Although CO2 is much less effective at the greenhouse effect than methane, an unbelievably higher amount of it will be released into the atmosphere if left to reach it. We should now compare the CO2 emissions from gas to current emissions from oil or coal. A study conducted by Stefan Jenner of Harvard University shows that all emissions from gas are down compared to coal, with CO2 from 25 kilograms per gigajoule produced to 15 for gas. This is a decrease of 40% when the fuels are combusted, which is a huge step down. It is also mentioned in the article that reductions of other emissions, such as sulphur dioxide, will be a huge boon to public health. However, apparently the effect on global warming is a mixed blessing, as cooling agents from combustion are reduced along with carbon emissions. There are ways around leaving the CO2 to escape to the atmosphere for companies on a large scale, which I will go through briefly. Firstly is Carbon Capture Storage, or CCS, which is fairly self-explanatory from the name, but can be expensive depending on method. Firstly, instead of burning gas and allowing the carbon emissions to escape, you feed the emissions into a compressor, which will allow for transport of a large amount of CO2. This CO2 is then transported to a drilling site where the carbon can be stored under the surface at very deep levels. 
The CO2 will be stored below impermeable rocks to cap the CO2 so it never reaches the atmosphere. This method can be very cheap compared to others as existing oil rigs have a drilled well below impermeable rock already, which must be good for storage as extracted oil must have been deposited there for millennia. However, it can also be used to extract more oil or gas. By adding the CO2 below the earth, it can push oil towards the well to extract oil more efficiently as the reservoir dries up. The main problem is transport of the CO2. It will either have to be done by pipe, which can cause controversies, such as at the North Dakota pipeline, but it is also generally more expensive. The other option is to use lorries to transport the gas. However, the lorries release carbon emissions. Both these options aren't poor options, as both reduce the emissions by up to 90% for oil and gas power stations, which will significantly reduce the carbon footprint of the station. The second option I will talk about is direct air capture, a method in which CO2 already in the atmosphere is captured by what are basically glorified air purifiers. The huge machines, like the one on the screen, are installed and filter out CO2 from the atmosphere, which is then collected for further use, much like carbon capture storage. This method is much more expensive than carbon capture storage, however it can be used outside of power stations, which is good for reducing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere in general. Both of these methods can, and should, be funded by the taxation of fossil fuels, whether it be from fuel tax, carbon tax, both of which come at the cost of energy companies. Another use of these taxes from fracking and other fossil fuels is it can be used to fund infrastructure for greener energy solutions, but that's a topic for another video. In conclusion to the greenhouse effect, gas releases less carbon dioxide than coal. We may as well replace the 9% of our energy from coal with shale gas. Although I do agree the amount of greenhouse gases released into the atmosphere will still be too much, the solutions are on the table and already being done in Norway. So why can't we do it in the UK? This covers the biggest environmental effects of fracking, and all in all, with the regulations in place, it won't be too big of a problem. However, there is still the question of economic viability and possible profits for the country to go through. But I will save this for another video. For now, thank you for watching, and goodbye.